All right, so now we're going to go ahead and look at a few questions off of your practice exam. And our first exam is going to be next week. Now, your actual exam is going to have 20 questions. I may include maybe 22 and let you pick the 20 you're going to do. But you're only going to have to do 20 questions. So I may add on a couple of extra ones, and then you can pick two that you would like to skip. And so that's, that's probably what I'll do, but you'll have to work out 20 questions on your exam next week. So we're going to look at some of these that I know we might struggle with. And I'll try to do one or two of each type. Whatever we don't get through this evening, I'll post online so you can see how I worked out each of these with the steps included. Um, how about we look at a mixture problem? How about we look at question four here? I think we're all pretty comfortable with zero factor. A lot of times those students really struggle with the setup on these mixture and the investment problems. So we're going to look now at question four. And this is a mixture problem. So what we're doing is we're mixing different concentrations of acid together to get the desired strength that we want. So we're going to work out now on your practice exam. We're going to work out question number four. So let's read it first and then try and determine where all the pieces go. So how much pure acid should be mixed with 8 gallons of a 50% solution in order to get an 80%. Now box 1 and 2 are not that important as to which one goes where. But box three is because box three is what we want at the end. So we want to end up with what percentage? Can someone tell me? When we're done, what percentage do we want to have? Okay, 80. So we've got our amounts and we've got our percentage rates. So we want an 80%. So 80% is going to go in box three. So always look and see what you want to end up with. What's the result? That's going to go in box three. Now when you read it again, it says how much pure acid. So we don't know how much. So that's going to be the unknown X in box one. And the concentration of pure acid is 100%. So we use 100% there. And we're going to have to mix that with eight gallons of a 50% solution. And what goes on the right on the amounts is these add together. So that's going to be x plus 8 there. Okay, because the way I remember is 1 plus 2 is 3. So these amounts add across. Now once we have our table set up, then we can look at the pure. And how do we find the pure? Remember, the pure is the amount times the percentage rate. And pure is like if I have salt water and I boil the water off. The pure is how much salt is left. Because if you have a solution, you've got water, and you've got whatever's in there. Like if it was a salt solution and you took out the water, what's left over is that pure salt. And we find that again by taking the amount times the rate. So on our first box, we have 100%, so that's 1, times x, so that makes it an x. Our second container is 8 times 0 0.5, because that's 
And on the right hand side, we have 80%, so that's 0 0.8. And how much is in there? X plus 8. And that's box 3 here. Order of operations. Parentheses go first. So we'll distribute that 0 0.8 through. And clean it up a bit. So we have X and half of 8 is 4. So that comes down there. And that equals 0 0.8 times x, distributing through 0 0.8 times 8. I believe that's 6.4. And it is. Okay, so we'll go ahead and solve this out. So I'm going to move that 4 over with subtraction. And a lot of times I like to put the 1.0 here so you don't make a mistake with the x. With decimal, students are are likely to make a mistake. So instead of just leaving it blank, let's put a 1.0. So we're going to subtract off now. There's 0.8x. Watch your signs and watch subtracting here. When the x's go together here, that makes it a 0.2x. The 4's cancel, right? 0.8's cancel here and here. And what are we left with? 6.4 minus 4, that's 2.4. We'll divide by our 0 0.2. And then rewriting, we get x equals now. It looks like 12. So what do we need? Let's label it. These are in terms of gallons. So we need 12 gallons. Of pure or 100% solution. Okay, so we're going to need 12 gallons of 100%. The hard part is always just completing the table. Once you've got the table, the equation is very, very easy to solve from there. And I know you've probably seen these before in several other classes, but we're going over them again. Uh, question five is like four, but instead of mixing chemicals, we're mixing money together in different accounts and funds. So we're now going to look at question five. Walt made $8,000 last year from his part time job. He invested part of it at 2% and the rest at 3.25%. He made a total of $197.50. How much was invested at the 3.2%? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and draw our picture here. Instead of using containers, I'm going to use money and dollar symbols. And let's start off with the first part in this question, which is that $8,000. And what is that $8,000? That's going to be what? The total amount, right? So $8,000 is my total. So that goes over here. Is everyone okay with where I got that from? Okay, so $8,000 goes on the right. Now we're going to invest this money in a couple of different ways. The two percentages we're going to put it in are a 2% and a 3.25%. Do we know how much money goes in the 2%? Is that given at all? So that's the unknown. So what do we do with that? We put the X there. Do we know the amount of money in the 3.25%? No, but what goes here, remember, is your total minus x. So your total minus x goes there. And how much money total do we have? 8,000. And so that's going to be 8,000 minus x. And these x's should cancel out, 
and the side should equal because they if you add across those cancel and that gives you 8,000 right equals what 8,000 think about going to the gas station and filling up your car if you go to the gas station and to, to fill up the tank in your car let's say you have to add four gallons of gas your tank holds 15 gallons so how many gallons did you start with? Well, you had to add 4 to fill it up. So 15 minus 4 would be what? 11. Right? So you started with 11 gallons, added 4 to get the 15. Same concept here. One is X, unknown. The other one is the total. So it would be like the size of the gas tank minus how much you put in. Now we work with our interest. And interest is the amount times the percentage rate as a decimal. And we'll label this 1 and 2 here. So our first account, unknown amount x, pays 2%, so that's 0 0.02 times x. Okay, let's just go together. Be careful with the decimals. What about the next one, the second one? Well, the second one is 3.25%, so that's 0 0.0325. And how much is in there? 8,000 minus X. And we need the total interest, not the amount. Students a lot of times get confused between the interest and the amount of money in that account. Think about a savings account. I might have... $10,000 in a savings account, but I may have only made $50 in interest. So $10,000 would be the amount, fifty dollars would be the interest. So interest is always smaller. And so how much did we make? We made $197.50. So that's what we've got for there. Now we can distribute through, solve it, and then we'll make sure we answer the question completely. This is a question that a lot of times students only get about 90% of it correct because they don't actually answer the question. So distributing through, we get 0.02x plus we've got 8,000 times that 3.25%. That comes out to be 260 minus 0.0325x. And that equals 197.50. Moving things around and combining. These can go together. Watch your signs. So 0 0.2 minus 0 0.325. It gives you a difference of minus 0 0.0125x there. We're going to move that 260 over. And so that gives you then a minus 0.0125x. Moving it over gives you a minus 260. Looks like it's a minus 62.5. And now we'll divide by that minus 0 0.125. Sorry, 0 0.0125 there. And that gives you then x equaling now what? So 62.5 divided by that 0 0.0125. Negative divided by negative makes it positive. And so that is 5,000. Now this is where students make a mistake. You got all the way to the end, but you didn't quite answer the question. This 5,000, what does this 5,000 go with? 2%. So we've got $5,000 at 2%. But that is not what we want. We want the 3.25%. So how would we find the 3.25%? We go back and we look. And that's going to be 8,000 minus X. So that's 8,000 minus 5,000. 
That gives you then a difference of 3,000. And that's what we want. So we know we need $3,000 to go into that account that pays 3.25%. So always make sure you answer the question. A lot of times students get to the X value and they just leave it at 5,000. 5,000 is not the answer to the question. You've got to go back and work it all the way up. Now, if, if you just left that, that 5,000, you'd probably get four points out of five. But to get all the points, you've got to make sure that you go back and completely answer that question. So, but if you got to this step, you'd probably get four out of five. If you got all the way to here, you'd get all the points. So let's work through a couple more of these. Uh, question six is pretty easy. So we're not going to focus much on that one. Question seven is, is fairly simple too, but we are going to go over it. Just to make sure you understand what's happening here on question seven. So on question seven, we're going to build a bookcase. And our bookcase needs to look like this. So the height of the bookcase is four feet longer than the length of the shelf. If 20 feet of lumber is available for the entire unit, so we don't worry about the back, but just the sides and the shelf and the shelves, find the length and the height of the unit. So first off, we're going to go ahead and dimension out our bookcase. We're going to label it. it. This is an easy question, and it's a real life application because you may need to build something, and you've got restrictions on how much lumber you have. So you've got a shelving unit. It looks like this. So there's our shelving unit. And what do we know about this? Well, it says the height of the bookcase is four feet longer than the length of the shelf. So do we know the length of the shelf at all? Does it tell us? No. So all these shelves have to be the same. To make it all go together, they have to be the same. So all those shelves are going to be labeled X. And there's four of them, right? You've got a top, two of the middles, and then the bottom. And what do we know about the height of this? Well, the height is four feet more, so that's x plus four. Now, how much total lumber do we have? We have a total of 20 feet to work with. So that's how much lumber that we have. What do we know about that 20? Well, that 20 is all these pieces of lumber added up, right? So if I add them all up, what should they add up to give you? 20, pretty easily. So let's go ahead and add them up and make it come out to be 20. So our equation is going to look like x plus 4 plus, and we've got four of these x's here, plus another x plus 4, and that's going to equal your 20. So we've got two sides and all the shelves. Combining all of our x's together, it looks like now we have 6x, and 4 and 4 makes it 8, and that equals 20. We'll move that 8 over, and that gives you now 6x equals 12. Divide by your 6, and x now equals 2. Now, 2 is not my complete answer, though. Again, we're 90% done. We've got to make sure that we answer it completely because we need to find the length of the shelves and the height of the case itself. So the length of the shelves is x, so that means the length is going to be 2 feet. So it's 2 feet wide on the shelves and the height. Well, the height 
is x plus 4, so that's going to be 2 plus 4, which then makes it 6 feet tall. So it's 2 feet wide for the length, and it's 6 foot tall for that height. And that's going to account for the 20 feet of lumber that we have. So we can figure out how to, how to cut that board to make this bookcase. And this is something that you may end up having to do. If you have to do any type of, of carpentry work or craft work, you may have to do something like this. And I just wanted to, to work through this one. This one's really easy, but you have to think about how to approach it. Okay, let's look at another one here. Um, let's do a distance problem. Question 11. And again, whatever we don't work through, when I post the notes, I'll probably do that tomorrow. I'll have a worked out key of this as well. Just like the notes, you'll see how all of them are worked out. So we're going to move on, I think, and look at 11. And I'm trying to pick the ones I know that we struggle with. So question 11 is a distance thing. And then we might do 10 as well, because 10 is easy, but students make a mistake with the time. And we'll do 11 first, since we started that one, and then we'll go back and do 10. So on question 11, we're working with distance. Now, what do we know about distance? There's three outcomes. They can add, right? They can subtract, or they can what? Equal each other, depending upon what we're working with. So on question 11, May drove to an appointment at 50 miles an hour. Her average speed on the return trip was 40. The return trip took one-tenth of an hour longer. And how far did she travel to this appointment? Well, what are we doing? If we draw a diagram, we're going to this appointment, and then we're going to come back home. So what do we know about these two? You know, if it's, if it's, 10 miles to the doctor's office, it needs to be 10 miles back home, right? So those should equal. So make sure you understand that's going to be an equal. And this one, when we work it out, we're going to get our value for the time, but we need to get the distance. So whatever we find is not our complete answer. We have to go back and again, make sure we answer the question. So May drove uh, at 50 miles an hour to her point. So that's the morning. So her rate of speed is 50, and we don't know how long it took her to get there, so we're going to use an X. So unknown amount of time, and she's going at 50 miles an hour. And then she's going to come back home from the appointment, and maybe she hits some traffic, and she's only going at 40 miles an hour on the way back home. And it takes her a little bit longer, so her time is not x, her time is x plus one-tenth of an hour. Is everyone okay with how I set that up? So we first identified whether it was addition, subtraction, or they equal. Now, when is it addition? It's addition when they go opposite directions, right, and they do not overlap. When is it subtraction? When they go the same direction and like you're running a race, they overlap, that's subtraction. And when do they equal? When you go back, and when you, when you go to some place and come back, they should be the same distance. So now we've got this, and we're going to use our distance formula. And your distance is the rate times the time. And I'll call this one 1, and this one down here 2. Where students make a mistake is at the very, very end. Because they don't, again, answer the question. So on the first, type, the first half, we've got 50 times x. So that's 50x. Now you told me it would equal the other side. And what's the other side going to be? 40 times x plus a tenth. Distribute that 40 through.
and the fraction is actually going to clear itself out. Let's work with that fraction over here on the right. So we're going to try and multiply 40 times a tenth. And I'll just put this over here. This is going to be my work. So 40 times a tenth. Well, that 40 is like a 40 over 1. And we just multiply across. So that's 40 in the numerator. 1 times 10 is 10 in the denominator. And 40 divided by 10 is 4. So now we have for our equation 50x equals now 40x plus 4. Right? And if it helps, you can always work things out on the side. That's the easiest way to do things. If there's something that you struggle with, always split your paper in half. Don't try to write it all over. Try to be neat organized. Mathematics is all about organization. You need to make sure you can find your work and find your answers. And that's where students get frustrated. If you kind of put things all over, you can't find bits and pieces, and you get frustrated. So take your time. Be nice and neat. Split your paper into pieces if you need to. We'll use a separate sheet of paper. We've gotten to this point. We can easily finish it. So we're going to move that 4x over. So now we've got 10x equals 40. Divide by our 10, and then we'll reduce. And we've got x now equaling 2 fifths. And what is that 2 fifths? That 2 fifths is the time. At 50 miles per hour, right? Now, is that what we want? Does it ask for the time? No. What does it specifically want? We want the distance. And again, how do we find our distance? Well, distance is the rate of speed times the time. And going back and looking up here, we've got 50 miles an hour, x was our time. So plugging that in, we've got 50 times 2 fifths. I'm going to write that as a 50 over 1, and 50 times 2 is 100. 1 times 5 is 5. 100 divided by 5, that should be what, 20, isn't it? 100 divided by 5 is 20. So how far did we actually travel? 20 miles to that point. So the important takeaway here is don't just stop at the two-fifths, because that's only about 90% of the questions. You need to make sure that you finish it. And in this case, we didn't want the time. We wanted how many miles we drove. Let's look at one more of these distance type of problems. And question 14. It's similar, a little bit different. We'll look at 14 next year. And 14 is an airplane problem. So an airplane flies from Gotham, from sorry, from Metro City to Gotham, with a tailwind that increases its speed. So it's got a, a wind that's going to speed up that airplane a little bit, and then when it comes back, it's got to fly against that wind, and so it's going to slow it down. What happens with an airplane or a car or a boat is is there's a speed that it can, the maximum it can go. Now, it might be able to go a little bit faster if you have some wind to help it, or current. And so in this case, we've got this speed of this airplane. The airplane can't go faster than a certain speed. But it might have some wind that might give it a little bit more speed. Or it might take it away if it's blowing the opposite direction. This is going to be another equal problem. 
because you're going to Metro City. Or sorry, you're going from Metro City to Gotham, and then you're coming back. So this is going to be another equal type of problem. And this one's different because we have a wind involved. And we've got the wind over here. And this is going to be our wind. Now the wind can either add or subtract from that speed. So this is the wind. And the wind speed is, if you read through here, 60. So we know that wind speed is 60. So when we when we go to Gotham, we've got a rate of speed that's unknown. Now I'm going to call x the plane speed. Because we don't know how fast that plane can actually travel. So it's it's traveling at an unknown speed x. Now when it when it goes to Gotham from Metro City, it's traveling at x. But this wind is going to add to it. And so that wind is going to add 60. And when we come back, what happens? Well, when we come back, that wind is, is pushing it the opposite way. It's, it's going against it. So when we turn around and come back to Metro City, that's going to be X minus 60. Is everyone okay with that? So you see how that wind is either going to add or subtract. And I like to draw arrows so I can see what's happening. And we know these are going to equal because it should be the same distance. What we now know is the time also. And we know the time to go to Gotham City is 2.78 hours. And the time to come back is a little bit longer, and that's 4.17 hours. So we're traveling a little bit slower coming back, and so that's going to decrease my time. Now we know these are going to equal each other, so let's write up our distance formula. Remember your distance equals the rate of speed times the time. This will be 1, and this will be 2. And we know they should be equal. So we now have 2.78 times x plus 60 equals 4.17 times x minus 60. And we're going to distribute it through, and we're going to find x. Now, X is, again, not going to be our final finished answer because X represents the speed of that airplane. But we don't want the speed of the airplane. We want to know how many miles it is from one city to the other. So we're going to find that airplane speed, and then we're going to use that with one of the times to see how many miles it is. So distribute that 2.78 through, and also that 4.17. So we've got 2.78x, and then we've got 60 times that 2.78, and that's 166.8 on the left-hand side. And then we've got 4.17x minus 4.17 times that 60. Watch your signs, that's negative. So that's a minus 250.2. <clears throat> now we can finish it. So move that 166.8 over. And move that 4.17x over. Careful with your decimals. So we've got 2.78 minus 4.17. That's a difference of minus 1.39x. Those can cancel. Those can cancel. What about the right-hand side? Well, the right-hand side 
is 250.2 plus 166.8. They're both negative, so that's going to be an, a minus 417. We'll divide by a minus 1.39. Double negative or negative over negative is going to make it positive. And that gives me then x is 300. And what is that 300? That 300 now is not my finished answer. That 300 is the plane speed. So the plane speed is 300 miles per hour. But that's not what we want. We want the distance. So let's go back and look at our first one. On our first one, we had this. We had our arrow going this direction. And we had our rate to be x plus 60. And our time was that 2.78. So that means... My rate of speed is 300 plus 60, which is then 360. Our distance then is going to be that 360 times that 2.78. And that's going to tell us how many miles we, we flew. So we've got our, our diagram redrawn. We put our pieces back together. And now we multiply that 360 times that 2.78. And we'll round here so it comes out to be 1,000.8 or about 1,001 miles. So that's going to be about 1,001 miles to go from one city to the other. Yeah, we're okay with that one. And you kind of see how that works. So a lot of these applications, you've got to make sure that you finish it. Because X is not always the finished answer. It's only part of the answer. I want to do one more. And I think that'll be it for this evening. So we'll do one more question. And you'll probably get out a few minutes early. So just to review, let's look at question 18. Eighteen is a simple question, but it looks more complicated than what it actually is. So this again is what's called a literal equation. And what's a literal equation? Well, just a very, very basic definition of a literal equation is an equation that has more than one variable. So this is going to have more than one variable. And on these literal equations, well, I have to tell you which variable I want you to solve for. And it looks way more complicated than what it actually is. I like to box things so I can keep track of them a little bit easier. And we're going to try and solve this for the H. So I want to find everything that has an H in it. So here is the only part that has an H. So the 2 pi r H has an H in it. Now, when we solve these literal equations, what's my goal? My goal is to get that variable, in this case H, all by itself. So this green box needs to be by itself. So I'm going to begin by taking away the 2 pi r squared. And I always like to write the variable I'm solving for on the left. So rewriting, we have 2 pi r h. And that's going to equal s minus 2 pi r squared. And how do we now finish it? Well, what variable are we trying to find? We're trying to find the variable h by itself. And how does that 2, that 
pi and that r relate to the h? It relates to it by multiplication. And what's the opposite of multiplication now, remember? That is what? Division. So how do we finish it out? We divide both sides by 2 pi r. And just leave the fractions the way they are. So you don't have to break it down. Just leave it the way it is. And then what's my final answer? H, that's the variable I'm solving for. And what is it going to equal? Well, it's going to equal S minus 2 pi r squared over 2 pi r. So that's your final finished answer. Now, how do you know when you're done? Let's remember and make sure we understand when to stop. What variable am I solving for? H. When I solve for H, what does that mean? That means H is by itself on the left-hand side. Is H by itself on the left? Yes, so we know we're done. Okay, so what's our homework now? Well, your homework is 1.4. You're going to need to finish that. And we got an exam next week. So make sure next week that you bring that completed packet to class. And what can we have on our, our exam next week? Just so we know, let's make sure we, we know what we can have for, for next week. So next week, we need to bring that completed packet back. And for the exam next week. You'll need to bring some scratch paper. You'll need to bring a calculator. Now, I, 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 I will bring in some calculators in case you forget one, but try to bring your own. So you'll want to bring your own calculator. But again, if you forget, I do have some here. So you want to make sure you bring a calculator. And then also, you can have either one page of notes front and back. Or you can have note cards. No, there's not really a limit, but you know, don't try to bring in like 50 note cards. You know, I, the note cards are really good because they're a really good study aid. And it, it, it helps you in other classes, too. I think the best way to, to prepare for a test like this is to maybe write some of the questions on the note card on the front and then how you work it out on the back. So you can review that question and try to find one that looks like it on your exam. On your exam, you're going to have 20 questions. So the exam has 20 questions. Now, I may add in a few extra, like I may give you 22 or 23 questions and let you skip two or three of them. And so I, I may do that. But you're going to have to know how to do 20 questions. Now, what are the questions going to look like? They're going to look like the questions off the practice exam. So you don't have to study anything but this practice exam. If it's on that practice exam, it's probably going to be on that exam. There'll be five of them that I'll probably take out. But if it's on this practice exam, be prepared for it on the exam next week. Okay? So I will see everyone then next week. And make sure, again, you bring in your notes. Now, if you have your homework ready next week, I'll pick it up then. But if, let's say, you work through 140, you made a lot of mistakes, and you want to go back and redo that, you can turn in that following week. The idea is just that math kind of builds on itself. So if you don't understand one topic, you may have to take some time to go back and work it again. But that's what we're going to be doing next week. And again, I'll have the video posted, and I'll have the notes, and then I'll have a worked out copy of your answer. I'll probably do that tomorrow afternoon. And I'll send it out in an email.